Welcome guys to section 3.2 of the fit to respond fit to retire certification as I said in the previous presentation we're gonna go over the three fundamental problems those are sleep deprivation exposures psychological and physical and chronic stress we're also going to discuss how all of these combine together to create a compounding effect this is a quote from Olin Green the US fire administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And he said, stress is one of the most serious occupational hazards facing the modern fire service. It's important to recognize exactly how stress can adversely affect our health, job, performance, career decision-making, morale, and family life. That's basically what this presentation is all about. We're gonna to try to understand these issues so that we can recognize them. So it's important to understand the autonomic nervous system so that you can understand chronic stress and the effects over time. So the system is broken into two areas and one is the sympathetic and the other is the parasympathetic. And the parasympathetic is involved in the rest and digest and the sympathetic is fight or flight. So these aren't systems that are either or they work together just like a thermostat does and depending on our ability to control that system the autonomic nervous system will determine on the the response on scene and going back to the analogy we talked about last uh, section when you're a new guy that response is overwhelming but the body adapts uh, there's one thing the body won't adapt to and that's the chronic stress. This is showing the response of those secretions within the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So the body responds to a stressful situation by sending that stressful stimulus to this area of the brain, which then uh, stimulates secretion from the adrenal glands. And that's where you get the glucocorticoids and the adrenal medulla is where you get that adrenaline. So these sympathetic hormones can be good and bad. And it is just dependent on the situation. In the immediate stressful environment when we need to survive or perform on scene, these can help us get the job done. But if we don't take time to step away from work and, and recover, then these will just build up. And generally with our job, we we go two days with pretty frequent uh, surges of the sympathetic hormone response and that obviously is dependent on uh, the station that you're at but generally it's more frequent than normal and what happens is uh, those catabolic uh, steroids or hormones stay in the system and they continue to have that catabolic effect which is basically breaking down tissues and over time that creates other issues uh, some maladaptation as far as fat retention and uh you know the 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 body's response also is to turn that sympathetic system all the way down so that response is almost non-existent unless it's a really critical call so that's that can be a maladaptation as well so that that's some of the bad that goes along with it when it's in our system for a prolonged period and a really interesting study that illustrates that point is it was done on the salmon that swim upstream upriver and what uh the study was is they pulled the adrenal glands which we just discussed uh, secretes a lot of these uh, catabolic hormones they pulled those from the fish so they weren't getting that surge of glucocorticoids and they found that they could uh, prolong the life of these fish for months longer. So that's just a testament to what this chronic stress does and the fact that we need to figure out a way to manage it. And cortisol also, that other that, that main, I would say it's a main glucocorticoid or it gets most of the attention, that has a detrimental effect on the brain causing intrusive thoughts and mental injury. Hans Seeley was a Hungarian endocrinologist who actually was uh, studying mice to try to figure out a new hormone 
um, that he's trying to discover. And he found out something pretty interesting uh, when he was studying these mice. So he's injecting them and he noticed that these mice were starting to develop uh, ulcers. He, he noticed that the more that they were injected, the more they were developing these ulcers. So he's the one that coined the general adaptation syndrome, and that's that acute adaptation is what it's referring to here. I added the, the supercompensation at the end just to uh, paint the picture of the goal, right? Is we can manage stress and stress is good, but that is only true if we're accounting for recovery and ensuring that that is happening. This slide is illustrating the point that we just made in the previous slide. If you look at the graph on the left, the sympathetic being in red and the parasympathetic in blue is showing the appropriate response, the normal response, where you see the full sympathetic uh, reaction and then the return to normal of the parasympathetic. Uh, and then on the right, you see the chronic stress response. And this is uh, getting a little bit more into the disorders that develop uh, specifically, but it is showing that over time, this is how the sympathetic system operates and it's not operating properly. It's not um, getting that complete sympathetic discharge. And that's due to the in inadequate proprioception, which basically means uh, the appropriate response to stimulus and understanding of uh, where we are and the response needed. And it's usually thought of when, when you're walking around anticipating a step or whatever, just understanding where you are in space, but it's also applicable to this. And then you get that diminished vagal tone and it becomes difficult to kick in that parasympathetic response. This is a slide getting a little bit deeper into that same issue of stimulus and, and problems that come up over time with the chronic stress. And these are all issues that are created by that. It seems like uh, you look at the top right that the circadian disruption is a thread that weaves itself through all of the issues. And we're gonna talk a lot about that here in a minute. But it, if, you go, if you start there, you can get into the need for caffeine, apnea, shift work. Those are all problems that create issues in the inflammatory signals in the brain and then the glycemic dysregulation in the brain, and then you get to the perceived stress where our perception isn't to the level that we're able, right? And uh, the level that we started the job at, but that perceived stress really does make the difference. And it's important to understand from our perspective because uh, there's gonna be a lot of individuals we'll work with that have different perceptions of life right now and depending on their overall allostatic load will determine whether or not they are able to manage uh, the stress of the job well. So allostatic overload is created when that uh, cortisol is in surplus and it creates free radicals which attack the brain cells. And this, I guess, is getting into that issue that we uh, talked about above where the cortisol creates uh, cognitive dysfunction and this also is caused by lower brain cells being formed because cortisol prevents the production of brain derived neurotropic factor and the picture we just looked at also referred to the systemic inflammation that happens uh, and the chronic stress uh, reducing levels of those critical neurotransmitters which help us with uh, avoiding addiction and just help us in general with well-being. So the overall effects on the, the body and the mind, and this is just some of the things that can happen. Uh, starting on the left with the brain, we get into the psychiatric issues that we can run into and sleeping problems are definitely within that. And uh, we, we get issues with the, the heart, breakdown of the muscle muscle in the heart and the immune system is affected and that's a major part of the sleep deprivation the first part of sleep deprivation we get an immune boost uh, we also get stomach issues and loss of libido 
um, reproductive issues, aches and pains in the joints, and lower bone density. So injury uh, possibility goes through the roof, right? And uh, our ability to function cognitively and perform appropriately on seeing goes down. And we, if you go to the right there, you see that cycle that can happen there. And what we're doing with this information is, is creating an understanding so that we can know how to break that cycle and create some tools to provide uh, a better way. In this slide, it's getting a little bit more into the perception and what it takes to be resilient. So it all starts with our early life experiences and uh, what what environment we were raised in what economic uh, status we had what education we had and it takes into account uh, physiological issues or disorders that we've had and that's going to determine the difference between adaptation and maladaptation obviously with the immediate wellness uh, factors coming into play of managing fatigue and and coping appropriately with things as they come. And that's all a part of how we were raised and how we were taught to manage. So that positive adaptation is what we're looking for. And there are some things that are required to get that positive adaptation. We need to have that stress in our life, but after that stress, we need time to recover and downregulate some of those hormones so that we can have that uh, level of the parasympathetic and sympathetic re return to normal. That's how we get that adaptation. And then we start it all over, but we need to make sure we have a goal and a specific plan for recovery when that stress comes or a goal and specific plan to apply stress for like a fitness program. And the idea is just, just enough applied stress to get you past the baseline to create that adaptation. The dichotomy of psychological stress uh, can create issues uh, within the job. And we've talked a little bit about this and uh, becoming emotionally numb and the tendency to develop a, a compassion fatigue mindset. So we don't have control of the call frequency and type and sometimes we have a feeling of, of control that's overwhelming when we're trying to help someone, for instance, a, a young kid, when we think that there's something we could do, you know, and, and during that short period that that patient care is happening, we have a huge influx of uh, glucocorticoids and these uh, hormones that respond to stress. So, over time, if we don't manage the issues that come or that stress that was caused by that specific call we just mentioned, then the overall allostatic load will go up and our situational awareness will go down. And then that will create less control because we, we can control how we handle ourselves on these scenes. And that's the one thing we always will have control of, but it's not as easy as that. It takes time and it takes preparation. We've gone through the the initial uh, graph showing the sympathetic parasympathetic response. So this is just showing the basic uh, catabolism that happens and the anabolism that we're looking to have in that recovery time. And that's the top left. Uh, if you if you look at the top right, I think that trend looks probably familiar to you or should look familiar. That was a trend that we saw with the addiction that can be created or the, the issues with addiction that can be created uh, by the cr chronic stress and the lack of recovery. And then the, the reduction of those hormones that, that we need to function like dopamine and the uh, opioid peptides. So the bottom right shows what happens with that general adaptation syndrome when we get into the exhaustion phase and how that lack of recovery uh, creates that downward trend. What activates the sympathetic system is going to be dependent on the individual 
and their perception. A firefighter that's been on the job for 30 years is going to have a different response than the firefighter that just got hired. And they're going to be on the two sides of the spectrum. And that would be the new firefighter having an over sympathetic response and the 30 year firefighter having that lack of sympathetic response because of the chronic stress. So looking at it from that perspective, each of these are going to create uh, that surge of glucocorticoids and catecho catecholamines, and it's just going to be dependent on the individual and their family dynamic and their personal state. And that that's their personal state is their overall allostatic load. So the the higher the load, the more uh, dysfunctional the response will be. So what what kind of stress are we talking about that? Uh, that we're dealing with and physical stress is definitely one. I think that we're all familiar with this. Um, regardless of diet success or failure, if, if dieting uh, in general is shown to increase stress and cortisol, which is really interesting. So we got to think about approaching nutrition differently and diets overall don't seem to be a long-term solution. And that's what we're looking for is a long-term way to manage uh, the overall uh, allostatic load of the job. We get into the psychological stress, which is uh, sleep deprivation comes into that. That's also physical because there's a lot of benefit that happens there. And, and uh, when we don't get that, we have a breakdown of tissues actually with throughout our body. And um, we get cognitive stress, uh, with the load of the job, the jack of all trades, information overload, and perceptual stress. Those are the storylines, as Rich Landward calls them. We get psychosocial stress, that's loss of uh, autonomy, freedom, uh, loss of employment, loss of loved ones, expectations of the family, patients, public, relationships, lack of social support, and uh, the lack of resources also creates issues uh, as the jack of all trades and that that can be up in the cognitive and uh, psychosocial and a lot of these stressors are multi they, they create issues in multiple different areas of stress this is just categorizing kind of a general idea of of what causes stress and then psycho spiritual stress is a crisis of values meaning and purpose which I uh, think is a it's a pretty big deal and one of the reasons people start hating the job is because they forget why they got into it the chronic stress has just been overwhelming uh, overflowing into other issues and and um, things in their life that has caused some destruction you know and and it starts to be stress that that eats into our views of values and meaning and purpose. So warning signs we need to look out for, uh, the, the symptoms of the issues that cause chronic stress, like sleep deprivation and even the exposures, uh, they're all similar and they all start to blend. So it's a matter of going from one thing to another, trying to do what we can with what we can. And that's the ownership side of what we're doing is we provide the education of the effects of the job and some ways to manage it, but then it's on the individual to actually do those things and not all of them are easy. Now we're going to get into sleep deprivation. Fatigue in the fire service is the thread that weaves itself through all the issues that we're managing and it does affect our performance on the job, mental and physical. So let's get into a, a, the specific nature of sleep and some of the terms that you'll need to know as we move forward. The circadian rhythms are physical, mental, and behavioral changes that, changes that follow a daily cycle. And this was a relatively recent discovery. And it's interesting how these things have been discovered over times and the studies that have been done. 
But last year, they found out something pretty interesting, and it basically uh, is that each cell has a DNA code or a clock gene within that that cell, and that that won some guys the Nobel Prize. Uh, let's see here, it was Dr. Jeffrey Hall and Michael Rosbus. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize for discovering that last year. It, is a pretty big deal uh, nowadays in society. Sleep deprivation is causing all sorts of issues, and I think we can see it in the mental state of our kids here in Utah, and the fact that suicide is the number one killer of kids 10 to 17. So the suprachiasmic nucleus is the master clock, and that just sits there behind the eyes, basically, and it functions as the circadian pacemaker and it also controls the release of melatonin. That's important because we'll get into some strategies to expose yourself to the sun and uh, try to time melatonin secretion to optimize your circadian rhythm. Sleep pressure, this is also something that is really interesting that's been recently discovered. There's a lot we don't know about sleep pressure, but what we do know is that there are uh, naturally naturally produced uh, hormones or um, chemicals in the body that build up this pressure um, and one of those they found in the cerebral spinal fluid uh, that builds up during the day is adenosine and they've tied this directly to that sleep pressure and as we discussed in section two adenosine is a part of ATP adenosine triphosphate and that's what we use for energy that's the energy currency that we've talked about so the buildup of that and uh, the cost of physical act activity and mental because we use uh, we use that for our mental activity as well uh, result in that adenosine accumulation uh, sleep debt is going to be the amount of time you have gone without sleep beta amyloid is another really uh, interesting recent discovery and that's basically plaque that develops around the nerves and it's associated with dementia and that's something that is cleaned out during sleep chronotypes is th this term has been around for a while but I think it's starting to really be considered as a legitimate uh, genetic part of human nature and that's basically each individual has a a time that they prefer to wake up and go to sleep and that's based on performance and some people feel that they are operating at their peak at night and other people feel that they're operating at their peak in the morning shift work sleep disorder is a circadian rhythm disorder and it's characterized by insomnia and if you think about our chaotic schedule it's comparable to a, a schedule that's uh, the modified shift work schedule which basically is the graveyard that's shifted around to be day work and then graveyard and then day work and that is one of the worst things that we can do to our body because it doesn't allow us time to adapt and our schedule is pretty similar we don't know when we're going to sleep and when we're not going to sleep and our bodies can't adapt to to that it's too chaotic and it it just doesn't work so we'll we'll get a little bit more into that uh, post-traumatic sleep disorder is a new term being used to describe the injury that happens with uh, trauma and and this is due to the consolidation that happens at night within our brains that basically organizing what happened that day so that we can use those things and adapt to the the following uh, situations that might happen in the following day uh, insomnia is basically the difficulty in falling asleep or staying asleep and it is uh, it, it seems to be more associated with a psychiatric medical condition than other biological factors because sleep apnea is such a prominent issue throughout the fire service I think it's important to understand the difference between central sleep apnea and obstructive sleep apnea so central sleep apnea is going to be an issue of the brain and neuromuscular connection and the signals that are being sent and you stop breathing basically because of the lack of stimulus happening there and I know it's associated with shift work uh, 
and low testosterone, uh, which is interesting. And then obstructive sleep apnea is a disorder caused by obstruction. Excessive daytime sleepiness is uh, just basically another term for hypersomnia. So how is this affecting the firefighter? And we could spend all day on this issue here. Uh, but I, I just wanted to highlight a few things. And one of those main things is that it definitely affects our job performance and our cognitive ability and our situational awareness. And there are more than 750 studies that have done to prove that it affects athletic performance alone. So professional teams are taking this pretty serious and they're hiring people like Dr. Walker, who, who is an expert and has done hundreds of studies on sleep, has written a book on sleep. We need to own the fact that we're not always going to get the best sleep, but there are definitely things that we can do to make it a lot better and uh, reduce these, these issues that affect our job and our families. Um, so the number one sleep specialist recommendation is to make it regular, make sleep regular. And like I said, that's one of those things we have to own. We can't really do that. And we need to have a strategy to approach a way that we can optimize what sleep is available. And NAPS is going to be a huge part of that. Uh, and working with the administration and together uh, working with each other as CFCs and also with Dr. Hollingshouse, who's interested in helping us out and has uh, already provided some awesome information in fatigue management systems. We talked about post-traumatic sleep disorder. The hippocampus stores memories and academic knowledge, and it also down-regulates the sympathetic system. All these things are going to affect that memory consolidation and uh, that emotional reactivity. Uh, the catabolic hormones are turned down. That's that sympathetic sy system that's uh, down-regulated at night. The thing that I want to look at with performance drops, it says 30% there with just one to two hours of sleep loss, and that's, that's pretty big. If you lose three hours, it bumps to 50% performance drop. And the study that we showed in the previous uh, presentation described that scenario there exactly, and that's... 17 to 18 hours of sleep deprivation showed that it was equivalent to a 0 0.05 blood alcohol level, 28 hours sleep deprivation, 0.1 blood alcohol level. Most of those people that went through the study claimed that they didn't feel they had any performance drops. Knowing is half the battle and getting this education out to the fire department is going to, I think, create some environments for improved job performance and overall wellness. What causes the sleep problems? Uh, we talked about uh, sleep apnea, insomnia, and narcolepsy. Those are intrinsic sleep disorders. It can be. Um, behave, they also, like we said, insomnia can be a behavioral disorder. Um, and that's that's caused by these behavioral factors uh, and anxiety that is caused by health conditions. And so these all kind of ha have an interlaced, interwoven uh, effect on one another. And then we get the, the screens. So blue light is definitely a disruptor of that circadian rhythm. And the brain sees blue light as sunlight and tells us to stay uh, awake longer and suppresses that melatonin secretion that, that helps us fall asleep. So sleep pressure and the, the culture of all sleep when I'm dead mindset. And this, I, I think we can equate this to the dirty turnouts. We know what that causes as far as cancer is concerned. So we need to start thinking in that way to sleep and what can happen if we walk around acting like we we can get by just fine on four hours of sleep. The examples you see here are just small examples within possibility as far as our job goes. Each one of these well-known disasters were caused by fatigue. Uh, 
The American Airlines flight went down because the captain was found to be fatigued, and he died along with 11 others. The Challenger uh, went into a ball of flames and blew up because the recommendations that were made by the engineers to postpone were ignored by the people running the show. That decision was made at 1 in the morning. And Chernobyl was caused by fatigue because the engineers working the power plant were working an extra long shift and were found to be fatigued. During the sleep cycles, it is important to understand because it's something that the body has required over time and hasn't evolved to the point that it doesn't need it anymore. So we're still required to have that seven to nine hours of sleep at night. And we're still uh, dependent, our bodies depend on the, the hormone distribution and the memory consolidation and that beta amyloid cleansing that happens. And those are in the late stages of sleep. And to get the full effect of sleep, we need to have that full amount of sleep time. And talking with Dr. Hollingshouse, he says that uh, we can either uh, prehab or pre-sleep before a shift, and that can help us make up for it. Uh, and we can also try to make up for it the next day by taking a solid nap and then getting the circadian rhythm back in order. And we'll talk about those strategy strategies later on. National averages of sleep. We just mentioned you need uh, seven to nine hours of sleep and we've dropped in the past 40 years from getting eight and a half hours of sleep to six hours of sleep. And I think that is directly related to all the psychiatric disorders that we're seeing. And there, there are plenty of studies stating that fact. We reviewed some of the accidents that can happen when you're fatigued and that have happened that have caused huge devastation. So this is this is giving you a better idea of what to expect on what amount of sleep and hopefully going to give you and other firefighters and uh, the fire department in general a heads up on anticipating what what may happen and the risk. So less than four hours of sleep, the chance of a car accident increases almost 12 percent or 12, 12 times. Sorry. And the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimated that drowsiness is the primary causal factor in more than 100,000 police reported motor vehicle accidents each year and resulting in 76,000 injuries and 1,500 deaths. Injuries are directly related to sleep deprivation and the graph on the left, you can see a really good study that was performed going through the times of day and the chance of injury. And there was a greater risk of injury in the early morning. And that's most likely due to the lack of sleep and the chaotic call volume during the night. And then on the right, you see the, the sleep compared to the chance of injury, the percent chance and with less than six hours of sleep, you get a 70% increase, 70% plus increase. And this is directly related to that cognitive dysfunction that happens with decisions that we make with uh, that neuromuscular connection and stabilizing a joint when we misstep. All of these things come into play. So if we're sleep deprived after one night, we could step backwards off of the truck do everything correctly, but because there was a little bump on the asphalt, uh, our, our ability to stabilize a joint didn't really happen quick enough, so we tore a ACL. You know, and that's that's one of the things that can cause injuries uh, with training as well in the gym. If we're trying to do deadlifts for a three rep max, and we got no sleep the night before, we're not going to have that stabilizing control that we had with normal sleep. So it puts our vertebral discs in a vulnerable position. Obesity is directly tied to sleep loss. You can see 
the amount of sleep and the percentage of obese individuals in the U.S. goes together hand in hand. And this is getting into decreased melatonin and the secretion of hormones and stress that is associated with sleep loss. Uh, so you, you get the psychological stress or the other stressors that we had mentioned, psychosocial, psychospiritual, um, and physiological, environmental stress. And you get that brain dysregulation that happens caused by the cognitive dysfunction of sleep deprivation and the melatonin excretion, uh, the sleep de deprivation at night, the arousal that happens caused by the, the body's uh, inability to downregulate the sympathetic nervous system. And then you get these issues that ca are caused and perpetuate the issues above uh, that are physiological problems like insulin resistance that causes diabetes and, and other obesity problems and just eating in general uh, issues with that which then causes coronary heart disease and then hypertension uh, is caused by the chronic stress and the lack of sleep. So during sleep, we get that rest and rebuild. We get the endocrine uh, boost and the sympathetic down regulation during deep sleep and growth hormone is uh, secreted during slow wave sleep and testosterone. Several studies have reported the effects of sleep loss on testosterone uh, decrease testosterone up to 30 percent plasma levels uh, were were seen in some of these uh, studies that were done assessing your level of sleep deprivation can be done by uh, filling out some questionnaires and a sleep study but you can start with these and the Epworth sleepiness scale is one that is recommended by specialists. And it's also one that the wellness fitness initiative recommends that we do as a fire department yearly to assess overall fire department fatigue. Allostasis in sleep. So we talked about what we need. Uh, we need, and it's underlined seven to eight hours, uh, and that's really dependent on our level of sleep deprivation. We talked about that study. We talked about uh, the sleep pressure that builds up and mental recovery and physical recovery and maximal performance. We've talked about all these things, uh, but in relation to allostasis, this is going to build up that overall allostatic load. And sleep is one of those times that we relieve some of that stress and allow ourselves to recover recoup so that we can have that increased capacity for the next day to respond appropriately and have that uh, self-awareness this is a chart of, of uh, some studies some significant studies that i think are important in regard to overall health and wellness within the fire service but especially here as we're developing our program and uh, looking, at, looking at these, you can dive deeper if you want, and I have access to these if you'd like. Uh, the daylight savings study is really interesting. That, that's uh, one that might be worth taking a look at, but the one that I wanna talk about here is the bottom study where they looked at the risk for suicide in 420 participants and this was a study done at the Stanford University School of Medicine. It was published after 10 years, so it was a 10-year study. And they found a direct relationship between suicide in adults and sleep deprivation. So during the study, and this is part of the uh, impact of the study, they, they had 20 individuals with chronic sleep issues commit suicide. And they found that there was 1.4 times uh, that people were 1.4 times more likely to commit suicide uh, than those without sleep disorders. So in general, if you have a sleep disorder, you're regardless of psychiatric disorder, if you have depression or not, you're, you're still at risk for suicide. And I think this is 
a huge study in regard to our efforts with peer support and mental health. Stimulants are going to be important on, on duty when we're trying to perform and get by, but they can create issues. And if we overuse caffeine, then it's not going to be what we need it to be on duty uh, when, when we need to perform and we're fatigued. So that, that's something that also needs to be taken into consideration. But the main thing that I wanted to consider was how it can mask the issues that are associated with sleep depri deprivation and that can cause issues in recognition, which is already an issue because of the cognitive dysfunction of sleep de deprivation. So it's just perpetuated by stimulants and it's something to be aware of. Uh, tobacco use, this is an interesting stat that I found, I believe it was on the IFF's website, but it's basically saying that we, our use of tobacco is through the roof, uh, but it's chewing tobacco mostly. Our smoking has gone down compared to national averages, but our chewing tobacco use is, is more than double national average. This is important because of the presumptive cancer bill that was uh, passed and um, is definitely a huge benefit to all of us so can we adapt to, to sleep deprivation? Uh, this was a uh, question that was answered by Dr. Kirk Parsley, who was a, originally a Navy SEAL and decided to become a doctor after that. And he became the doctor for the Navy SEALs. And he did a lot of work with them and found that they had extremely low testosterone, which he found to be caused by sleep deprivation. So the question is, can you compensate for shift work? And the answer is no. Uh, we haven't adapted over time and evolved to not need the, the sleep. It puts us in a vulnerable state. So you would think if we didn't need it, nature would adapt and allow for less, but we do need it and it's essential and we're always gonna need it. And each individual is gonna be different. There are some people that can get by with less sleep, but that number is really slim. Uh, I think uh, this, it was Dr. Walker who wrote the book on why we sleep that said that it, it, it's a fraction of a fraction of the population who can get by on the amount of sleep that a guy like Jocko Willink can get by on. So what can we do? Uh, we, we can perform a needs assessment, look at where we are in general, and look at the fatigue management system. Um, we can promote good sleep and the importance of sleep and uh, doing that with this evidence that we've, that we've got all around us. And we need to uh, take a look at how to make changes that um, are based on evidence and based on studies done here at Salt Lake to come to, to come up with interventions to present to the administration and the union. The American College of Physicians recommended, and it was cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia before using medications. And they said that it was more effective than using medications for the long term and safer, obviously, because of all the issues associated with some of these medications and our employee assistance program offers access to the sleep coach. Uh, it's not the same currently, but I just talked with HR and we can provide information specific to our job to make uh, this a little more valuable because the general information isn't going to help much with our chaotic schedule. And one of those things that we're going to discuss in this next presentation is, is what we can do specifically to uh, optimize what sleep we can get when we can get it. Uh, exposures, we're referring to the physical and the psychological, uh, and we've discussed some of those already, uh, but specifically heat, carcinogens, communicable diseases, injury, exertion, all these physical exposures create stress. And then you add fitness programs that are chaotic and not uh, developed 
with the firefighter in mind and with the individual in mind, that's going to create stress on stress, and you're not going to get whatever adaptation you're aiming at getting with, with that uh, chaotic program. The level of exposure when it comes to psychological and physical exposure is going to be determined by preparation and our overall allostatic load and our capacity at that time to manage psychological stress and even physical stress. So we're talking uh, taking the time to recover, to uh, understand how to perform better is that positive adaptation that will prepare us for a sit situational awareness and understanding how to respond more appropriately in the future. So that continuous positive adaptation is going to prepare us, and that's physical and psychological. So one of the things that has been found and noted, uh, and it's, it's uh, here in quotes by Dr. Lawrence Blum, is that the glucocorticoids that are secreted during a stressful response are directly related to the tunnel vision, the muffled sounds, the gaps in memory, the detail errors, the episodes where the firefighters' reports don't necessarily coincide with what actually happened on scene. The results of those exposures and not being prepared and lack of situational awareness because of allostatic overload is going to produce injury, psychological and physical. The desensitization, irritability, cynicism, intrusive thoughts, mental injury um, causes problems within the family. Thermal stress, real quick, this is uh, something we've talked about in the past, and there's studies proving that heat is directly re related to cardiac events because of the extreme situation that we place our bodies in when we go into fires. And uh, it's a, a good uh, description of the overall psychological stress as well. We have made huge advances in technology, but our bodies aren't really meant to uh, operate in some of the environments or uh, with all of these technological advances. Um, so we get these issues that are created that are secondary to these uh, solutions that were brought to the fire service in the past. So we got to figure out what has created issues in the past and how we're going to take with these, these good things that have happened and deal with the secondary effects of those things. So basically your body isn't able to cool off. So it goes into overdrive, pulling fluids from every part of the body, including the cardiac uh, muscle. And that, that can create some immune response, some, uh, the coagulation cascade, the, the cardio ischemia. Um, it's also going to create that, uh, blood brain barrier, uh, infiltration of cytokines, which are linked to depression and psychological disorders because of all of the fluid that's brought in from the gut. It, that fluid, because it's brought in so quickly, uh, is, is, coming along with all of the other stuff that hasn't really been uh, filtered out appropriately. So that creates an immune response and an excess level of cytokines, which are basically the inflammatory response. This study was done by the universe, Indiana University uh, Firefighter Health and Safety Research Department. Uh, they, they found that the higher the physical demand or emotional stress, the greater rise in temperature, as well as the amount of hormone released. And that's what we've talked about, those glucocorticoids. Um, and the heat definitely uh, creates a, a huge stress response. Um, and it's not just, these, these issues aren't just tied to one thing. And that's why it's so important to approach uh, the problem with a holistic mindset because of the ties that all of these problems, cardiac problems have to multiple different parts of health and wellness. This is another study proving that exposure to heat is causing cardiac events. And they proved this in, in healthy adults with no risk factors. Physical adaptation is going to be limited as we just discussed and 
this is where preparation is going to be critical moving forward and having a good plan for hydration and fitness and even communicable diseases. Uh, and all of these things are going to be affected by sleep deprivation and chronic stress and overall al allostatic load. So adaptation will only happen if we're accounting for recovery in all areas of, of uh, life. Overtraining, uh, this is going to happen when we're not accounting for recovery. Basically, the main reason for overtraining is not taking time to recover. And that means sleeping. That means stepping away from the job uh, psychologically and uh, allowing your, your mind to recover. And there's stages. So we get functional overreaching, that's short term, and then non-functional overreaching, which is long term. And uh, the functional overreaching, that, that's going to produce that positive adaptation if we have that uh, recovery. And non-functional is that um, damage that, that's going to be caused when we don't account for recovery. Underperformance is another word that is being used to describe overtraining or used uh, as a term instead of overtraining. And that's uh, because some individuals think that the term limits the understanding of the causes of overtraining, which is multiple, right? And that, that really, I think, is important as far as we're concerned, that it's not just exercise that causes overtraining. It's uh, overall allostatic load. So this is something that, that really needs to be taken into consideration. And this is kind of the message of this presentation here is that it's not one thing it's stress on stress and that's sleep deprivation stress piled on top of family expectation stress you know piled on job expectation stress and and not managing uh, things as they come and one thing also to keep in mind is that the the number one indicator of underperformance syndrome that is seen first is that mood uh, state change. So causes lack of sufficient recovery and it's the sum of all stressors and we're prone to it because it's the compounding effect of the job and you know all of these things that we just uh, described. I wanted to show this uh, slide because of the correlation it has to the symptoms of all the other issues that we've discussed. And uh, it shows how it gets to that systemic inflammatory response, which creates all these issues you see on the right in that flow chart there on the left. So the point that I'd like to make is basically the situation is complicated and it can, can be confusing which leads to a problem of recognition. And uh, a lot of people might just assume that being extremely fatigued is just part of the job and not really look further into how to manage that fatigue. And I know that was the case for myself until I, I realized that I needed to figure out a better way. And, and um, researching all of this information has, has been just that, it's been for me as much as um, information for everyone else. To recap a little bit, the results of the issues, the three fundamental problems that we've discussed are gonna create maladaptations if we don't plan to avoid them and uh, manage them. So this slide is also speaking to the point that these issues have a direct effect on our families. And it's an important point to make for multiple reasons. They, they didn't choose the job, as we said. I think another important point is basically building on the previous slide is these, these things are difficult to see coming. And uh, numbing yourself for a shift to get by to manage calls may be an appropriate way to get through the day, but not managing after that day those, those issues will just lead to this. So the idea here is to see these th things coming and, and create a plan to avoid them in the future. There is a compounding effect. And some people might say, oh no, I'm, I'm good. 
the, these things don't bug me. And that might be true, and that's good that they don't bug them, but why? We need to understand why so that we can help each other learn because maybe that call did bother somebody. And we've talked about perception, how much that comes into play. So this is a matter of figuring out how to ensure that we're not shoving things down deep and understanding that we have a tendency to do that. Regardless of how you manage, there are consequences to exposures. And that's what this study is proving, that those exposures may lie dormant for a period of time before some incurrent adversity leads to the manifestation of those issues. This Mexican proverb drives that point home. And one thing that I think is important to keep in mind is the fact that this is part of the job. Just like the sympathetic response is the body's uh, response to the the stressful environment physiologically you think about the surge of glucocorticoids but if you think about it from the psychological standpoint we are there to manage the scene and try to uh, create a little bit of order in all the chaos regardless of the gnarliness that we're seeing on on that scene so to be able to do that from one call to another we have to shove things down deep so that we can perform to a, the best of our ability. And it's only meant to be a short period of time for that shift or for that call even, um, so that we can manage right and there initially, just like the sympathetic response, but just like the sympathetic response, it, it's going to create some damage if it's not managed and if it's prolonged. And that's, that's where this issue comes in is we we take this uh, tendency and it becomes a habit sooner or later we're gonna end up paying for that and the longer we go without paying the the greater the cost and that's what is being described by this quote by Hans Seeley at the bottom every stress leaves an indelible scar which means permanent and the organism pays for its survival after a stressful situation by becoming a little older. This program isn't just about fitness. It's not just about uh, getting in the gym and exercising. It's about creating increased autonomy and a sense of control and efficacy to manage the, the stressors of the job and coming up with protocols and guidelines and interventions to make that happen. Thank you for hanging in there throughout this training. I know it was a long training. I'd really tried to cut it down as short as possible while keeping in the information that I thought was, was critical to moving forward. Uh, please give me your feedback and I'll uh, talk to you in the next one. Thank you.